chapter 25, the RNA viruses that infect humans. Last time we did the DNA viruses, this time we're gonna do the RNA viruses. Okay, the RNA virus is gonna include like HIV, uh, coronavirus, things that a lot of people are, that think a lot of things that we deal with. So RNA viruses, RNA is a diverse group of microbes. They're assigned to one of 12 families based on their envelope, which surrounds the capsid and the nature of the RNA genome. Remember, RNA is usually single-stranded. Here's your 12 types of viruses here. You have got, um, so here's your RNA viruses. You can have enveloped or non-enveloped, okay? Of the enveloped, you have single-stranded genome, and they're segmented versus non-segmented, okay? You have the orthomyoviruses, the bunny viruses, like influenza, the bunny viruses, which is the um, hantaviruses, uh, the pulmonary one, um, pulmonary surface, uh, pulmonary syndrome, sorry, and the arena viruses, which is laser fever. For the non segmented ones, you have the paramoxoviruses, which is your measles and mumps. You have your rhabdoviruses, which is rabies, fluoroviruses, which is your Ebola, that's an extremely deadly disease. Coronaviruses are your SARS and your MERS. Okay, the Togo viruses are rubella, and the flaviviruses are your Dagon uh, dengue fever viruses, and the uh, um, Zika virus disease. <clears throat> of the single stranded genome, okay, you got your AIDS, which is your retroviruses. Okay, in the non enveloped category, you got your single stranded genome again. And you got your P coronaviruses, which is polio, hepatitis A, and your uh, calcistic viruses, which is your Norwalk enteritis, and the double stranded. I mean, that's a very uncommon for double stranded RNA, but there's one, of the, those are the real viruses, which is your rotaviruses diarrhea, which it causes. I'm going to go through each of those in the lecture today. So, any questions, I'll interrupt me and ask me, because these are the ones that are mostly that are a lot of concern today in our, our, our world. And this is a summary of what we just went over, the influenza viruses, the hantaviruses, what it causes. Uh, we call it, we're doing with mumps, with measles, uh, dealing with rabies, with the rabies virus. Uh, hepatitis, one of the causes from jaundice, from the hepatitis C virus. And so on, encephalitis, from the St. Louis encephalitis virus. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, uh, yellow fever, uh, dengue fever. HIV, human emissions, uh, human emission deficiency virus one and two. Uh, polio virus, which is one of those where they're almost on the verge of wiping off the face of the earth with the uh, vaccines that we have. Uh, hepatitis A virus, rhinoviruses, which is your common cold. Okay, Ebola viruses, Ebola hemorrhagic fever, which is fatal, and Creutzfeldt Jacobs syndrome disease, uh, which is um, injury from a pyrant that invade the brain. And it, it's, it's got by strictly eating the viruses through eating infected brains, cow brains, uh, mad cow disease is what causes in cows. And that's why it's a big field to keep track of cows and keep track of why, we, why you have that. All right, so enveloped, segmented, single-stranded RNA viruses, the ortho viruses, the binary viruses, the arena viruses. Okay. The biology of the ortho myxoviruses, there's three distinct influenza types. They call influenza, which is the common cold, uh, a common flu, I'm sorry, that's our flu vaccine. Flu vaccines are something different than the corona vaccines. Just because you have the corona vaccine doesn't mean you should not get the flu vaccine and vice versa. There are different aspects of it. Okay, they have similar traits and stuff like that. But the flu vaccines put out is the CDC looks at the 20 different strands of viruses going to typically cause the influenza. They take those viruses, they put it into a vaccine by attenuating it. They're killed viruses and they inject you with those viruses. Okay, they can't, they cannot cause the flu. Okay, because they're, they're attenuated, they're dead. But the antigens on the surface trigger our antibodies and we make antibodies to those antigens, the 20 types. So the 20 types of flu, you can infect it with one of those common ones. We already have antibodies there, so we don't, it does, you don't get as sick and you can treat it quicker. Now, if you get infected by the 21st virus that they have on their list, you're gonna get the flu, okay? So it's just the 20 that they pick and that's the viruses that we inoculate for that. Where uh, the virus for um, the coronavirus 
is very new and it's only against that one antigen. And as that mutates, as we're seeing, you're getting different reactions to that virus. So the flu, the flu vaccine is something you definitely should get. It's been around a long time and it, it definitely helps. So there's three distinct influenza viruses. There's type A, type B, and type C. Type A is the one that causes most of our infections due to the flu, okay? Type A is the H1N1. Okay, H1N1 was a Spanish flu pandemic in 1918. New Jersey in 76 was a, the swine flu. It was caused, the one in Russia, Texas, and the pandemic of the H1N1 in 2009. Okay, it's also responsible with H2N2, okay, and H3N2, which is the Hong Kong flu pandemic. Okay, those are all type A, those ones in our recent history of this flu and uh, influenza. Type B, there's no subtype to it, and type C, there's no subtype. These are mild cases that don't cause the same effect as the type A influenza virus. Okay, so for influenza infections, the virus attaches to and multiplies in cells of the respiratory tract. It's fed by droplets, just like the coronavirus is. Okay, very similar. Okay, segments of the RNA genome enter the nucleus. Okay, the virus, uh, the finished viruses are assembled and bud off cells inside their assembled body. They use the, their own body cells to produce the virus. Okay, so here's how influenza works. Virus, uh, this is the virus, okay? It absorbs to the respiratory lining. It sticks to the respiratory lining, the epithelial cells by these hemagglutin spikes. See all those spikes coming off it? Those allowed to stick to and hold on to the epithelial surface of the endothelial uh, respiratory lining. And it fuses with the membrane. That's the first step. It has to attach and fuse. So the virus is endocyti endocytosis. Remember endocytosis? Endocytosis is when the membrane swings up, pulls around, and pulls the virus particle inside. Okay. So the virus is endocytosis into a vacuole and uncoated to release its eight nucleocaptic segments into the cytoplasm. So here releases. It's eight segments of RNA into the cytoplasm, okay? Then the cytoplasm, it's from those, those eight segments are transferred into the nucleus of the cell. That's where your RNA and DNA replication are going to occur. So the nuclear capsules are transported into the nucleus. Okay, they're the minus sense RNA strands, which are shown in black here, like how black is green. These are your RNA strands, okay? Are transcribed into DNA. So these become rewritten, they are transcribed into DNA. Okay. Now the RNA is used to make the synthetic glucose. Uh, it, okay, let me back that up a second. Sorry. Transcribed into the positive RNA, the, re, the reciprocal of it. Remember, adenine binds to uh, glutamine, cytosine binds to guanine. Okay. So now you got the positive strand of the RNA to it. Okay. So your synthesized make the synthesized glycoprotein spikes inserted into the Membrane hose after you do that. So you've got these, these new ones manufactured right here. Okay. And then these can come into the back to the cytoplasm, these positive RNA ones. Okay. And they bud back off again and form into another virus that can infect other cells. So you got the release of the mature viruses occurs when viral parts gather the cell membrane and are butted off with an envelope containing these spikes. So now that's your mature spikes with the positive form of RNA for decoding into the proteins that the virus needs. So the positive sense RNA strands are used to synthesize the new negative RNA strands and assemble it into the nucle uh, uh, nuclear capsules, transported out of the nucleus to the cell membrane. Okay, so it's basically a transport using the cell machine to transport and allows this virus to spread in the positive ends. Okay, so key to influenza are the glycoprotein spikes. Okay. Hematoglutin H, there's 15 different subtypes of it. Most important virus factor binds to the host cell. The neuroaminidase uh, N has nine subtypes. Okay, hydrolyzes mucus and acids viral budding and release. Both glycoproteins frequently undergo genetic change, decrease the effectiveness of the host immune response. So as these, pro as these um, hematoglutin spikes, or evolve in the different area in different uh, cells, they start to change. So as they change, our antibodies aren't going to recognize them anymore. That's why you can still get sick with things like that. And here's what the influenza glycoproteins look like. You see the different spikes, different types. They're going to bind to the epithelium of the respiratory system. 
and those can modify as a virus evolves. Okay, so the influenza mutation, a uh, constant mutation is called what's called antigenic drift. So it gradually changes the amino acid composition. The antigenic shift, one of the genes of or RNA strands, is substituted with a gene or strand from another influenza virus from a different animal host. Okay, so you get the genetics from one strain from a different animal host of another strain. Okay, that forms a new strain that's called antigenic drift. Okay, so an antigenic drift is an antigenic shift, one gene or another. So the genome of the virus consists of 10 genes and codes on eight separate RNA strands. Okay, so here's your hRNA and nRNA for the different spikes, one from a duck and then hRNA from a human. Okay, they infect a different host, say a pig, rat, some other host that is an immediate for it. Okay, and they merge. And they form the H and N ones from one from the duck, one from the humans. Now you get a different combination of the H and N spikes. So the, the antibodies you already made for the human factor that we had doesn't work because now we got the duck ones to do it. So it doesn't bind to those as well. It doesn't find that it's foreign. So the, your immune system has no recall for the duck antigens found in the virus now. That's your antigenic drift. So the influenza strains, no one case your chronicles virus types, animals of origin location, and the year of the origin. So influenza A, remember, was the most virulent of the strands. B and C weren't that, that uh, virulent. Okay. After 2003, strains of influenza A virus that usually infect birds underwent an antigenic shift and began to infect humans. That was the bird flu scare. Okay. Influenza B only undergo antigenic drift, no antigenic shift. They just modify it, but they don't shift to the other form. Influenza C, known to cause only minor respiratory problems, not, not involved in any epi epidemics. So A is the one that we're worried about. A is the big one that causes all these um, pandemics and things from the influenza. Influenza A, that's the violent one. It's acute, highly contagious. I don't know why they went through there. Okay. So influenza A is acute, highly contagious respiratory illness. Seasonal, pan, uh, seasonal because we get the flu vaccines every season for the flu, okay? Causes pandemics. It's one of the top 10 causes of death in the United States. Most common among your elderly, okay? And small children, okay? That's due to the fact that the immune systems in the elder are compromised and the immune systems in small children are not developed adequately yet. It binds to ciliated cells of the respiratory mucosa, causes rapid shedding of the cells, stripping the respiratory epithelium, causing severe inflammation in the lungs. It's because of your coughing and your shortness of breath, things like that. That's stripping the respiratory epithelium, severe inflammation, causes fever, headache, malaysia, pharyngeal pain, shortness of breath, and coughing. The weakened host defenses predispose the patient. Okay, secondary bacterial infections, especially pneumonia. You don't die from the flu, you die from pneumonia. Okay, it causes your senses to weaken, then pneumonia can take over, and that's what actually kills the patient. So diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of the influenza. Diagnosis, rapid immunofluorescent tests that we use to detect antigens. So we're looking for the antigens, okay, in the pharyngeal specimen that are common on the influenza A virus. Uh, blood testing, serological testing to screen for the antibody titer. Treatment, we control the symptoms, okay. Amidiodine, uh, ripentinine, xanavirmer, uh, relin, which is now Relinzer, and osteol, osteolet Mver, which is Tamiflu. Those help control the symptoms. The flu virus has developed high rates of resistance to amanidine and rimatidine. Annual trivalent vaccine is what's recommended. So the treatment is getting the vaccine to prevent the flu from the first place. Okay. Bunea viruses and the arena viruses. They're transmitted zoonotically through different species. They cause periodic epidemics. They're extremely dangerous. Biosafety is level four viruses. Okay. Uh, California encephalitis, the, um, the, the Bonea virus transmitted by insects and by ticks. Move that up to the side. Okay. Has California encephalitis, Rift Valley fever, Korean hemorrhagic fever. The American Bonet virus is a hantavirus. Okay, the hantavirus pulmonary syndrome is what caused it, is an emerging disease. It's a high fever, affects the lungs, that's where it comes into contact with, edema, 
pulmonary failure, 33% mortality rate. Okay, so with the hantavirus, one third of patients are going to die from it. Okay. It's carried by deer and harvest mice, transmitted via airborne dried animal waste. Urea viruses, okay, cause Lysa fever, Argentine hemorrhagic fever, Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, and lymphocytic uh, choriomeningitis. Closely associated with the rodent host, okay, it's transmitted through aerosols and through contact. Airborne. Okay, so which of these happens in the case of antigenic shift? Which of these? Okay, when you have antigenic shift in influenza A, remember influenza A is the one that has the antigenic shift. You get single mutations in hemagglutinogen. Okay, recombination of RNA segments between bird and human strains. Change from influenza to influenza B. Okay. But well, we know it doesn't change influenza A to influenza B. They're two different things. Okay. So I want to go whether it's, it's both A and B or either A and B. Single mutations in hemagglutinin. Okay. Is it only is it one both? mutation? What's that? I is it I, both A and B? Well, it definitely does B. It does have a recombination of my segments between bird and human centers. They mix. But this says single mutation here. Is it only one mutating? A nucleotide is it a single mutation? No, it affects the whole chain of them. Remember, it affects that whole chain, inserts that new chain into it. So it mixes the whole chain. Like we have here, we saw the duck and the human, and it took that section of the duck. It didn't take this one piece. It's not just one single mutation. The whole chain merged to it. If we go, let's see if I can go back to a picture I was thinking about. Yeah, right here. Okay, you see in here, see the the DNA here. It's not a single change. It's this whole section right here that can incorporate into it. So it wouldn't be single. It's kind of a tricky question because it's single there. So it'd only be B, the recombination of RNA segments between the bird and the human strains. Because you do get mutations in the hemagglutinin. You do get that, but it's not single. Okay, it's a whole section, not just one, one thing. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, perfect, good. So it's a, it's a whole section of combined DNA on this. So it's a recombination of RNA segments between the bird and the human strain. So it's segments, not just segment. It's the different segments that combine. I know it's kind of semantics, but it's not a single mutation in the hematoglutin. It's, it, it's, a, it's a mutation. Remember the hematoglutin is only one of the spikes. Okay, that's only one of the spikes. Remember you get changes in the, 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 the H and the N. Okay, so that would just that one, just the recombination. All right, envelope non state amount of single stranded RNA viruses. These are the uh, para myoxiviruses, okay, para influenza, mumps viruses, morbilla viruses are your measles, okay, pneumoviruses, respiratory, syndical viruses. The rhabdoviruses are your rabies, the coronaviruses, which has been in the news for the last two years. Toga viruses, this is rubella, the flaviviruses, which is hepatitis C, and the filoviruses, which is Ebola virus. Okay, so let's start with the paramyxoviruses. Paramyxoviruses are parainfluenza and your mumps. Okay, morbilla viruses are your measles viruses, and the pneumoviruses are your respiratory viruses. We just went over. Okay, the pneumovirus by respiratory transmission binds to the respiratory epithelium. The envelope has the glycoproteins and F spikes that initiate cell to cell fusion. So the two different spikes that bind itself to it. Fusion with neighboring cells is synctium or multinucleate giant cells form. Okay, we see multinucleate giant cells with the DNA virus we talked about last time also. And this is your proxy virus. Let's say your molt, here's your cell. Now you got this giant cell and look at all the nuclei inside of it. Okay. The parainfluenza is infection by the paramyx virus. It's widespread as influenza, but it's more benign than influenza. Has respiratory transmission, respiratory transmission the same way. It's seen mostly in children. Primary infection in infants can be severe enough to be life-threatening because infants have a poorly developed immune system. Okay, minor cold, bronchitis, bronchopneumonia, and the croup. Croup is what is caused by this parainfluenza virus. Croup is really dangerous or more susceptible with infants. No specific treatment is available. 
You just do supportive therapy. You support their symptoms. Mumps, epidemic parotitis. Okay, it's self-limiting illness. You the last 14 days at the most. Associated with painful swelling of the parotid salivary gland, and you get the typical chipmunk cheeks in kids. Okay. Humans are the only reservoir. Mumps do not occur in other species it gets transmitted, only in humans. 40% of infections are subclinical. And with them, once you get a case of it, you get long-term immunity. You get 300 cases in the United States per year. The incubation is two to three weeks of fever, muscle pain, malaise, classic swelling of one or both cheeks. So 14 days to 21 days is your incubation period with it. Usually uncomplicated invasion of other organs. You know, most times it stays to itself in the parotid glands. 20 to 30% infected adult males get epidemic, um, epididymis and testes become infected. Sterility with those cases is very rare though. Okay. Symptomatic treatment, treat the symptoms, treat the sore throat, the swelling, things like that. Live attenuated vaccine is part of the MMR vaccine, which prevents it. Okay, muscles, measles, muscles, measles and rubella vaccine, the MMR. Measles, it's caused by the morbilla virus, also known as red measles or rubilia, ru rubiola. Okay, Di it's different from the German measles. It's very contagious, transmitted by respiratory aerosols. Humans, again, are the only reservoir, uh, reservoir of measles. Less than 100 cases per year. It's a frequent cause of death worldwide, outside the United States, though. Okay, so two forms of measles. There's a regular measles, which is the rubi rubiola, which is your red measles, and then the German measles. Okay, there are different viruses that affect them. Primarily check the, for measles, it's a child. For German measles, it's a child and the fetus. Complications, uh, pneumonia is possible with measles, and congenital defects are possible with German measles, a lot more deadly. Okay, skin rashes are present in both, and coplic spots, which are different things shown in the mouth, are present in the measles, not the German measles. All right, so measles, virus invades the mucosal lining of the respiratory tract. Okay, initial symptoms are a sore throat, dry cough, headache, conjunctivitis of the eyes, lymphadenia, swelling of the lymph nodes, and fever. Coplic spots. We so we just said coplic spots are found in the uh, measles, not in the germ measles, and those are found on the mucosa of the skin, the freezing of the teeth. Those are oral lesions. Exanthem are characteristic of the red maculate papula. Those are eruptions on the head, progressing to the trunk and extremities, covering most of the body. Those little red bumps you see with the measles. Okay, these are the coplic spots. You see the little ulcerations here on the, the free gingiva underneath the teeth. Okay, those are interoral or interoral lesions. And then these are the red spots you see throughout the body. Progress down from the head, down through the trunk, down to the rest of the body. And that's the measles. Okay, most serious complication is subacute scler uh, sclerosing, panencephalitis, progressive neurological degeneration of the cerebral cortex, white matter, and brainstem. One case in a million infections. So one case out of a million has this subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, okay, infecting up in the brain in the cerebral cortex. Okay, so those cases involve a defective virus spreading through the brain by cell fusion and destroys cells, leads to coma and death either in months or in years, depending how aggressive it attacks. Okay, no treatment for that one. It will it will kill you if, once it gets in that stage. Okay. This is an attenuated viral vaccine. The MMR prevents this. This is a vaccine for it. Attenu remember, attenuated means killed. It's a dead virus. It will not cause the disease, but it transmits the antigens on the surface of the virus so the body knows that it's foreign and kills before it gets hold in the body. Respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, also called new, uh, pneumoviruses. Okay, it infects the upper respiratory tract, produces giant multinucleated cells that we saw in the picture. Most prevalent cause of respiratory infection in children six months or younger, most susceptible to serious disease. They don't have a developed immune system yet. Epithelia of the nose and eye are the portals of entry. Replicates in the nasal pharynx area. You get fever, rhinitis, uh, pharyngitis, otitis, and the croup and croup. Okay, treatment. Synergis is a monoclonal antibody, blocks the attachment to the cell. So you have the antibody that blocks it from attaching to the cell so it can't infect the human. RSV, immunoglobulin. Uh, ribovirin is an inhaled antiviral drug.
Okay, rabies. Our rhabdoviruses family, the genesis, list of virus. It's an envelope. It's a bullet-shaped variant, bullet-shaped virus. Okay, very distinctive shape. It's slow, progressive zoonotic disease transmitted from animals, dogs or another animal infected with it. Prime reservoirs are wild animals. Okay, it can be spread by both wild and domestic mammals by bites, scratches, and inhalation of droplets. That's why rabies shots are very important to get for puppies, any kind of domestic animal. This is the shape of the virus. Again, it's a very unique shape. It's a bullet shape. You can see the bullet shape here on the picture also. It's got the glycoprotein spikes that attach to the epithelium, the matrix protein around it, and then the nucleal capsule that controls the RNA. It encapsulates the RNA inside of it. So in rabies, the virus enters through bites, grows at a trauma site for a week, okay, and then multiplies, then enters the nerve endings and advances towards the ganglia spinal cords and the brain. So it, it, enters the, it enters through the skin by bite, and it goes through the nerve system up into your spinal cord and brain. That's what makes rabies so deadly. It doesn't infect other organs, it goes right to the brain. Infection cycle is complete and the virus replicates in the salivary glands. Clinical phases of rabies, okay, the prodromal phase. You have fever, nausea, vomiting, headache, fatigue, some experience pain, burning, tingling sensation inside of the wound. Okay, the furious phase, which is agitation, disorientation, seizures, twitching, hydrophobia. It's called the dumb phase. You can become paralyzed, okay, disorientated, stuporous. And then this, is, this and then the fourth phase progresses to coma. The coma phase results in death. Okay. That's where you get the rabies vaccine treatment immediately when you think when you can't find out if the dog's rabies rabbit or not. This is rabies distribution in the United States. You can see the blue areas. It's transmitted by skunk, usually in the uh, north, north, northern part of the United States, in the and including California. Raccoon is transmitted through the uh, eastern part of the United States, and fox transmitted through part of the southern parts of the United States. Okay, so management of rabies. It's extremely important. Once often diagnosed as uh, autopsy. Okay, intracellular inclusions called negri bodies. Okay, in the nervous tissue. It's a bite from wild or stay. Uh, okay, it's a bite from wild or stray animal, demands assessment of the animal, meticulous wound care, and specific treatment. Okay, if you don't diagnose it right away, then you do die from it. And that's why at autopsies, that's where we see it. We see these negri bodies, these black bites in the nervous tissue which means the patient had um, rabies. Preventive therapy initiated if signs of rabies appear, appear. Okay, treatment, okay. Passive and active post-exposure immunization. This is the only disease I know of where you do a passive and active post-exposure immunization. In other words, you're giving them the vaccine even after you've gotten it. Okay, that's your, for your passive, yeah because of the severity of this disease and the post-exposure immunizations. So you're getting passive and post-exposure immunizations. Infuse the wound with human rabies immunoglobulin, HRIG, and globulin. So you're given rabies immunoglobulin and globulin. The vaccination with human diploid cells vaccine, an inactive vaccine given in six doses with two boosters once you've diagnosed it. Control, control of rabies is vaccination of your domestic animals. So that's why it's important to get them vac uh, vaccinated with the rabies vaccine. Elimination of the strays and strict quarantine practices. Live oral vaccines according to bait for wild animals. So in the wild, we, we leave out bait and it incorporates a vaccine inside that bait. And that helps to reduce the control number of animals with rabies. Look, so which disease are active and, now you better get this one right, we just said it. For which disease are active and passive immunization given simultaneously? Was it influenza, yellow fever, measles, or rabies? Which one has both? Rabies. Rabies. Here we go. It's the only one that I know that has active and passive immunization once it's done. And they agree with us. They agree it was rabies. Coronaviruses. We've heard a lot of that. We've been invaded with the coronavirus information by, 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 by politicians, everybody else. Coronavirus is a relatively large RNA virus with distinctly spaced spikes on their envelopes, common in domesticated animals. There's five types of human coronaviruses having characterizes. Among these are the agents of the common cold, some forms of the viral pneumonia and myocarditis, some human enteric infections, and severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS. Okay, airborne transmission, 
Nine percent of the cases of SARS are fatal. Not nine percent of, of coronaviruses. SARS is a portion of the as a sub category of the coronavirus. If you get SARS with that, then it's 9% fatal. Coronavirus is not that fatal on its own. Severe acute respiratory symptoms is SARS associated with the coronavirus. It's a new liver disease, it's 2002. It's transmitted through droplets or direct contact. Fever, body aches, malaise. May or may not experience re uh, respiratory symptoms with breathing problems. Severe cases can result in respiratory distress and death. Diagnosis relies on exclusions of other likely agents. In other words, if you're getting sicker and sicker, and it's not one of those that we know about, there's a chance it could be SARS. Treatment is no direct treatment with it, but treatment is supported. Support your symptoms, keep your patient alive. Rubella, okay, caused by the rubavirus, which is a single-stranded RNA with a loose envelope. Also called, this is a German measles. Rubiola was the regular measles. Rubella is the German measles. It's an endemic disease. Most cases reported are adolescent and young adults, okay? So children and young adults are most cases of rubella. Transmitted through contact with respiratory secretions. Okay? Diagnosis based on serological testing, okay? There's no specific treatment available. We do have the vaccine, the MMR system. Um, mumps, measles, and rubella, okay? That's our MMR vaccine we have. Two clinical forms of rubella. There's a postnatal rubella, okay? And there's a congenital rubella. The postnatal rubella is mal uh, malaise, fever, sore throat, lymphadenopathy, rash, generally mild, lasts about three days. Congenital rubella is an infection during the first trimester, most likely to induce miscarriage or multiple defects such as uh, cardiac abnormalities, ocular lesions, deafness, mental and physical retardation. Okay. Hepatitis C, caused by the flavivirus, okay. acquired through blood contact, blood transfusions, needle sharing by drug abusers. So it's, it's direct blood to blood contact. Infection with very characteristic, 75 to 85% remain infected indefinitely throughout the life, so carry the hepatitis C virus. Possible serious symptoms without permanent liver damage. Uh, liver damage. More common to have chronic liver disease, because that's where it affects is the liver. Most of have chronic liver disease with or without avert symptoms. Cancers may also result from a chronic H, uh, hepatitis C virus infections. We treat with interferon, an anti-cancer anti drug, basically, an antiviral drug. Ribavirin is to lessen liver damage, but there is no cure for it. We can lessen the treat. We can treat it and keep it under control sometimes, but there is no cure and there's no vaccine for hepatitis C. We do have a uh, vaccine for hepatitis B, but not for hepatitis C. Okay, the arboviruses, okay, viruses are spread by arthropod vectors, you know, ticks, fleas, things like that, they're arthropods. The arthropod vector of mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, and gnats. There's 400 different viruses. The toga viruses, the flaviviruses, viruses, some Brunera uh, viruses, and the Rio viruses. Most illnesses are caused by these viruses are mild fevers. Some may cause severe encephalitis, okay, and life-threatening hemorrhagic fever. The influence of the vector, vectors of the viruses tend to be clustered in the tropics and the subtropic zones. So the many temperate zones have periodic epidemics from these vectors, that's where they live. The arboviruses life cycle are closely tied to the ecology of the virus, of the vectors. Okay. Infections show a peak intense when the arthropod is actively feeding and reproducing. That's when the disease spreads. Humans can uh, serve as a dead end accidental hosts, or they can be a maintenance reservoir. They don't go from humans back into the virus. They stop at the humans, okay? And then they can be maintained in there, the human body, or you serve as a dead end for it. Controlling the vector controls the disease. So we control the disease by controlling the vector, okay? Getting rid of the causative uh, arthropod. This is to see the distribution of it. Most of it, I mean, zero, you know, very, very little in the United States, just very back to the southern, very, very little in northern Russia, top of Africa, most along the equator. Most of these is in the, the temperate zones along the equator. General characteristics of the arbovirus infections. You have acute arbovirus infection result in undifferentiated mild fever with rash, but no long-term effects with it. The prominent symptoms are fever, headache, malaysia, and joint stiffness, and rash. Now, viral encephalitis, Okay, and cause that in the brain, meninges, 
Remember the meninges protect the brain, they protect the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, you have the three layers. You got the uh, pia matter, uh, subarachnoid, uh, pia matter, arachnoid matter, and the dura matter is the other layer. So those three layers become infected with this virus, can spread to the brain. So the brain and the spinal cord are involved. Convulsions, uh, tremors, paralysis, loss of coordination, memory defic deficits, changes in speech and personality. So it will change a person, person uh, can change a person's personality, cause coma, as far as my experience, permanent brain damage with these viruses. Okay. Arbovirus infected in the United States. You have the West Nile virus and cephalitis, transferred to humans by mosquitoes, infected by bird's blood. 80% of the people infected show no symptoms. Less than 1% develop neurological incidents. So less than 1% of these develop a neurological incidence from encephalitis or meningitis. Okay. Colorado tick fever. Most common viral uh, tick-borne viral infection in the United States, uh, Eastern equine encephalitis, Eastern United States and Canada, uh, lacrosse encephalitis (LACV) is Midwest United States, Appalachian Mountains, prevalent cause of viral encephalitis. Those are your arboviruses. In, in St. Louis, encephalitis, silent infection, common of all, common of all in America, is the most common in America. Epidemics in Eastern and Central states. Chigungunya, chigungunya virus, infections in the Caribbean in 2013. Most patients' symptoms are fever, headache, muscle joint pains, nausea, vomiting, and occasional rash. Has a very low mortality rate with it. The Zika virus, symptoms are similar to infections with uh, chicken, chikungunya and dengue viruses. Birth defects if mother is infected during pregnancies. So if mother's infected with uh, the Zika virus, it is gonna cause birth defects during pregnancy. Hemorrhagic fevers. These are deadly fevers, okay? Complete fevers with bleeding inside the body. Yellow fever was eliminated in the United States by vaccines. Two patterns of transmission, the urban cycle, humans and mosquitoes, and the sylvan cycle, forest monkeys and mosquitoes. That's in South America. Yellow fever causes acute fever, headaches, muscle pain, may progress to oral hemorrhage, nose bleeding, vomiting, jaundice, and liver kidney damage, and very high significant mortality rate. Dengue fever, the flavivirus carried by the mosquitoes, is not, not in the United States, but it's usually a mild infection. But it can cause problems. It can be severe. The dengue hemorrhagic shock syndrome, which was called breakbone fever, is extreme muscle and joint pain, and that can be fatal. All right, so rubella is a serious infection for both children and adults, true or false? Remember rubella? Go back to our rubella. Here's whoop. Rubella skis into uh, arthropods. Uh, that's not rubella. Where did I see it? Oh, there's rubella. Okay, so rubella is called virus. That's the German measles, okay? So adults and young, I mean, children, adolescents, and young adults. So that's most of the cases of rubella are caused it. Okay. And remember, it can be very serious can cause the congenital form of it, whether they infected through pregnancy during the first trimester, it can cause major problems, it can cause physical retardation, mental retardation, cardiac anomalies, and so on. So let's read the question again. Rubella is a serious infection for both children and adults. Should be true, right? It's actually children and young adults, but that's where, that's where rubella spread, is spread through. And answer today, it's true. It can be a serious infection. Usually it's not, but it, it can be in children, small doses, it can cause uh, from congenital rubella. Whoops. All right. HIV infection and AIDS. Human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. It's the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. It first emerged in the early 1980s. Severe pneumonia, it causes severe pneumonia. That's what causes death is a pneumonia. Severe pneumonia caused by pneumocystis. Gervasi, which is usually a harmless vir uh, fungi. Okay, it's a fungus, but when the immune system is compromised, this fungus can take over and cause the problems because our immune system becomes compromised with AIDS. It's a rare vascular cancer called Kapos or Kaposi sarcoma. Now those are the black dots that show up in the mouth. This one has a hard palate, very large black dots. One of the Kaposi sarcoma, one of the dianoxifers of 
Sudden weight loss, swollen lymph nodes, general loss of immune function. That's the problem, general loss of immune function. 1959, that's the first documented case of AIDS. Characteristic of the human retrovirus. The HIV is a retrovirus. Okay, encode reverse transcriptase enzyme, which makes it double-stranded DNA from a single-stranded RNA. So we take a single-stranded RNA, which is our, AIDS, or it's our virus, HIV, and we convert that to a double-stranded DNA. Okay, that's encode reverse transcriptase. So that's reverse transcriptase, reverse it, going from our, normally have double-stranded DNA going to single-stranded RNA, but messenger RNA transferring and so on. Reversing that process. We're taking a single-stranded RNA and going to a double-stranded RNA, which makes this such a deadly virus with no cure. The viral genes permanently integrate into the host. So now it becomes a permanent part of the DNA of our host because it's double-stranded DNA. It incorporates right into our double-stranded DNA. Okay, the cause of acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Okay, characteristics of the human retroviruses. You see the different uh, spikes on the end. This is a, a GP120 docking glycoprotein. This is GP41 transmembrane glycoprotein. These are the ones that cause a lot of the problem because they cause the binding of the virus to our cells. We have a lipid membrane. We have the viral RNA inside. We have a capsid surrounding the nucleic acid. We have a matrix supporting it. We have reverse transcriptase molecule. Okay, these little reverse allow the RNA to single strand RNA to convert to double stranded DNA. And we have an integrase molecule that allows it to integrate into our DNA. Okay, so is there, are the HIV, the virus bonds to our cell. Okay, we have a CCR5 co receptor at a, D, at a CD4 cell. We have a CD4 receptor on a white blood cell. So it blinds the white blood cells, which is our immune system. Okay, we have a CXCR4 co receptor on a CD4 cell. Okay, so these CD4 receptors allow this binding from the GP41 spike on the DNA virus. And once it binds, then it can transmit into the cell. It has to bind first. This is what the virus looks like human retroviruses. We see different receptors. So HIV infections, HIV1 and HIV2. The T cell lymph uh, lymphotropic viruses, one and two, leukemia and lymphophobia. HIV can only infect host cells that have required CD4 marker plus a co-receptor. So the cells have to have the CD4 marker, which is our white blood cells. Okay, again, same picture we saw. These are our CD4 markers. And these allow the GP41 mark, the GP41 stem antigens here to bind onto our cells and allow transfer of the HIV RNA, single RNA virus into the cells. Okay, the epidemiology, transmission occurs by direct and specific routes, mainly through sexual intercourse and transfer of blood or blood products. Babies can be infected before or during birth and from breastfeeding. HIV does not survive outside the body. It does not survive long at all. Outside the body, but not incorporated in the blood supply, the virus dies just on surface contact. I mean, soap and water kills it, okay? It's not one of these other, like uh, hepatitis B, which can survive for three months on a surface coating on, on the outside of the cell, like forming those spores. HIV does not do that, okay? This is the epidemiology of HIV infection, okay? You get blood exposure through needles. Okay, or you get infected macrophage in the epithelial cells. We have a laceration where you can get into a cut, seminal fluid, vaginal fluid, get exposure during sexual intercourse. If there's any kind of lacerations, it can get it can pass through the epithelium. <clears throat> Direct blood exposure during sexual intercourse or other intimate contact, it gets in. Okay, this is a this is a membrane of the skin for entry of the, the virus. Okay. It becomes incorporated into the um, white blood cells. Get rid of that there. Okay, so this is a virus, and as you see, you incorporate the white blood cells. The white blood cells then come into the dendritic cells of your nerve system under the skin and, and amplify the virus. The virus can then spread through the lymph nodes into the bone and then into our bloodstream as it circuits through the body. 
Okay. First nationally notifiable was in 1984. It's the sixth most common cause of death among people aged 25 to 44 in the United States. Men account for 75% of new infections. IV drug abusers can be HIV carriers, significant factor in the spread to the heterosexual population. Okay. In 2009, the number of infected individuals worldwide that's meant to be 35 million, with a 1.2 of those million in the United States. So it's a big problem. Epidemiology, the diagnosis of infection among adults and adolescents. So most of the spread, male-to-male -male sexual contact, is 67% of the spread of AIDS. Okay, Heterosexual contact to the female is 16%. Heterosexual contact to the male is 7%. Okay, most of the flu being deposited to the female. Injection, drug users, IV drug users, females get 3%. Injection drug men, they'll get 4%, pretty close. And male to male sexual. Get rid of that. Whoa, come back. Okay, and male to male sexual contact accounts for 3%. Okay, and, and um, contact and I do, I hear that wrong, sorry. Male to male sexual contact and IV drug users combined are 3% with those two combined. Okay. Rates of HIV infection among adults and adolescents. This was in 2014. You can see the, the yellowish colors here. These are very high rates Florida, Texas, Nevada, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. All those areas are very high rates 13.7 to 53.6% per 100,000. Okay. See the extremely low rates are the light. Blue, light blue colors. Okay, Alaska, light blue colors, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Utah. Those are your light because less spread of that. Okay, you see how it's spread through the United States. Pathogenesis and virulence factors. HIV enters through the mucous membranes or the skin, which you showed in that, that picture, travels to the dendritic phagocytes beneath the epithelium. Okay, remember, uh, remember phagocytes uh, eat different things in the body to protect it. Okay, it eats these viruses and they come and pour it in the cells. These then go into the neuron, the, the, the dendritic cells of the neuron. Okay, multiplies and then is shed. Virus is taken up, magnified by these macrophages in the skin to the lymph organs, bone marrow, and the blood. HIV attaches to the CD4 and co receptors. HIV fused with cell membranes. Reverse, transc reverse transcriptase, remember? Reverses our transcription process. Enzyme makes double stranded DNA copies from the single stranded RNA of the virus. Viral DNA then is integrated into the host chromosome. So DNA becomes part of our host chromosome because now it's double stranded DNA and it can fuse into our chromosomes, our DNA. It can produce a, ly a lytic infection, which means an active infection, or it can remain silent, it can remain latent. A lot of times it remains latent for 10, 15 years. And then it expresses itself. This is our, our multiplication of the cyclic of uh, HIV. It binds receptor to CD4 receptors. And see the red things are things we can use to prevent that. CCR5 antagonists, which stop it from binding, or post-attachment inhibitors. For once it, is, it allows it to dis disassociate and not release in there. Then you get fusion. You get fusion of the, uh, the uh, in internal components of this HIV virus which is your reverse transcriptase, which is your uh, one that incorporates the DNA and your single-stranded RNA. So it's fusion of the HIV envelope and the CD4 cell allow the virus to enter the cell. Once it enters the cell, in the cytoplasm, it uses a reverse transcriptase okay, to convert the single-stranded RNA to double-stranded DNA. The, the, so now the double-stranded DNA enters the nucleus. The RNA does not enter the nucleus. Okay? It stays in the nucleus and gets packaged when it goes back out because you can see this is going to be repackaged back as that goes out. But the double-stranded DNA enters the nucleus. Okay? It carries the enzyme integrase. The integrase allows the DNA to open up and the a viral DNA to be inserted into our own DNA. So now whenever the cell replicates, we're replicating the gene for the DNA virus. The gene for this virus causes this replication here. Okay. 
and the replication combines with the original single-stranded RNA, okay? And binds excuse me, with the cell membrane buds and produces a new virus, which has the, uh, the RNA from it, which has single-stranded RNA and the reverse image RNA. The original RNA also is incorporated into it and the RNA produced from the DNA to produce the proteins and everything for the virus. Okay. So what that basically showed us was the virus is absorbed, fuses with the cell. The CD4 component allows it to fuse. The twin RNAs are uncoded. Those are single strand RNAs. Reverse transcriptase, catalyzed reaction, okay, a single a strand of DNA. Okay. So we make for go for a single strand RNA to create a single strand of DNA. The single strand of DNA acts as a template for the double stranded DNA. Because now it's going to combine with other nucleotides in the nucleus. In latency, the double strand DNA is inserted into the host chromosome as a provirus. Now the virus is inserted into the chromosomes of our DNA. So after a latent period, which can vary, various immune activators stimulate the infected cell causes reactivation of the provirus, which is that section of DNA that codes for the virus, okay? And then the production of viral messenger RNA. Okay, that viral messenger RNA, just like the messenger RNA we produce, now we're coding for it for the, the virus. The next step is HIV me uh, messenger RNA is translated by the cell synthetic machinery into the virus components. It builds the capsid, it builds reverse transcriptase, it builds the spikes, and the viruses are then assembled. And we get the budding or the mature viruses lice, the cell, the infected cell, okay? So when they're threaded, they build off and it lyses or destroys the infected cell. Remember the infected cell is what? The infected cell is our white blood cells. That's what confines our immune system. So we're restoring the cells of our immune system as these viruses are multiplying and budding off, okay? So that's basically how HIV works in the body. There's different stages. Pathology is tied to two factors, the level of the virus, how much we have, and the level of T cells in the blood, how much have been destroyed. Primary effects of HIV infection is extreme leukopenia. Okay, we're losing our leukocytes, white blood cells, our T cells, formation of giant T cells and other cydia, virus spreads. Okay, infected macrophage release the virus into the central nervous system. Okay, toxic effects and inflammation. Secondary effects of HIV, the CD4 lymphocyte destruction, opportunistic infections, and malignancies during full-blown days. The, our, our immune system and the, the immune system has been destroyed to the extent where it can no longer fight opportunistic bacteria or opportunistic other viruses or yeast, as we saw with pneumonia. So this is the stages of HIV infection. Okay, so the le let's do the, the, green, the green line. I'll use a green marker here. This is our green line. You can see it goes up really quick and then drops down and then it starts to rise after the latent period. This is the level of the viruses, the HIV antigen. So at first, the virus comes to the blood and it's really high. Then the macro starts to absorb it. So the level starts to go down and it lays latent. Can be two years, can be 10 years, can be 15 years. Then it gets reactivated as the provirus. And then the antigens can start to pick up again. Okay, that's how the virus levels, the antigen circuit because the virus increases. The levels of antibodies is initially low because we didn't have been exposed to it. We get exposed to it, antibodies shoot up to help protect it. And then with time, the HIV virus will mutate. And we'll show you that in just a second, how the spikes are gonna start to mutate on the HIV virus. So then they're not where our HIV, our antibodies will start to go down because we're not recognizing it anymore. Okay, Professor, I have a that's question. supposed to be the Oh yeah. Um, so when you first get HIV, it's really, um, there's a lot of blood um, of the virus in the blood count, so it shoots up. And, then, yes. and then our body starts to recognize it as foreign, so then the macrophages come out and try to, so it kind of lays latent, but once, but you're still immunocompromised, right? And then once you've been infected, because then you get AIDS after, or you can get AIDS after HIV. Right, remember the, the, the virus that you're eating by the macrophages, and those are incorporated into the white blood cells. And then so your the free flowing virus is going to start to drop down. It's going to reduce for a long time. And then it's going to lay latent in those nerve cells where they have it. So, so what, it, it can stay for 10 to 15 years with no, no symptoms. 
well, what, what if after 10 years it, it spikes up? What can spike it up again? That's what triggers it. Remember, it's a provirus. It's a, it's, a, it's a gene that's inside the DNA of our chromosomes now. So when something activates, just like with the herpetic virus, remember? Something triggers it and it acts up. Like chocolate something peanuts the AIDS virus. Like yeah, but that's not with the AIDS virus. The AIDS virus, we don't know the exact trigger. Because oh, some okay. people have it, like yeah. um, Magic Johnson from the LA Lakers, right? he had that 15, 20 years before anything was showed on it. Okay, so different and different treatments can prevent that from spiking up, things like that. But we're not sure what causes it to reactivate itself. Okay. Because some people have been with some two to three years, some people have been 15 to 20 years. Interesting, very interesting. Yeah. It's, it's a very complex virus. It's not a typical virus. That makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense um, because a lot of people can be positive for HIV, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're that they can't that they're going to be sick or feeling you know they're going to basically be asymptomatic for a while. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Sure, no problem. And then the CDT4 cells, those ones that bind it, those bind it first. They bind real proper to it, and then they start to drop down also. So what that shows us is here is it's the, this is a set the. Virus levels are high during the initial acute infection, which makes sense, and decrease until the later phase. So they're very high, then the body incorporates them, and then the levels of the virus actually detectable have decreased until later on when they're reactivated so through the provirus stage. The antibody level gradually rises and remains very high throughout phases three and four because we produce the antibodies to the antigen. The T cell numbers remain relatively normal until the later phases, once it's reactivated, and then you get HIV disease in full-blown AIDS when the T cells start to be destroyed by this virus being released. Remember, the virus is inside the T cell. And once they become released and multiply, it lyses the T cell. So it starts to destroy all our T cells. That's when you get your full-blown AIDS. Okay, so symptoms are related to the viral blood levels and to the levels of the T cells initial infection, okay? They're, the, so the symptoms are related to the levels of the virus that's present in the blood and how many T cells we have. Mononucleos, a mononucleosis is very like a similar symptom to that, but those disappear on their own. They don't, link, they don't stay for like the AIDS virus. The asymptomatic phase, which you talked about, once you're incorporated into those macrophages into the T cells, can last 10 to 15 years, average of 10 years. So like I said, as early as two years, as late as 15 years. Okay. AIDS is immune system destruction. That's what it is. It destroys your immune system. When T4 cell levels fall below 200 T cells per milliliter, AIDS symptoms appear. We just don't have enough T cells to fight with our immune system. Okay, it includes fever, swollen lymph nodes, diarrhea, weight loss, neurological symptoms, opportunistic infections, and cancers. <clears throat> so you got infection with the virus occurs. We get appearance of antibodies in our standard HIV test. You get asymptomatic HIV disease. Why is it asymptomatic? Because it's now incorporated into our cells with the provirus and we have, we're not reading the provirus. We're not expressing those genes. It's just infecting the cells and staying there. Okay. And that can encompass an extensive period of time, variable time period. Once something triggers it though, that's when that provirus react. They start producing the messenger, the yeah, you know, the messenger uh, RNA that are going to make all the components of the cells. They're going to get high levels in the body again and burst all those T cells that are located in. <clears throat> so, over symptoms of AIDS include uh, some combination of opportunistic infections, cancers, and general loss of immune function. Now, diagnosis of AIDS okay is based on detection of the antibodies to the specific to the virus. <clears throat> in the serum or other fluids, and you at the second level. We have initial screening, the ELISA test, which we talked about, latex agglutination, <coughs> and the rapid antibody test, similar to what we actually use for coronavirus. That you have to have that to fly in nowadays, too. Rapid results uh, may result in a false positive. So we follow up with the Western blot analysis to allow false positives. False negatives can also occur. Persons who may have been exposed should be tested a second time three to six months later. 
because on no test is 100 percent that's why you need, if you, and AIDS is an extremely deadly disease with which calls for extreme treatment so you if you get a positive test you verify it if you get a negative test you wait and check it again you make sure <clears throat> so diagnosis of AIDS is met when a person meets the criteria positive for the virus and they have something else. They fulfill one of these additional criteria. They have a CD4 count of fewer than 200 in the blood. Okay, that's full-blown AIDS. That's when your this white blood cells are down at CD4. The white blood cells contain CD4 that allow the binding. Okay, CD4 cells account for fewer than 14% of lymphocytes. Again, your white blood cells are being destroyed. And they experience one or more of a CDC-provided list of AIDS-defining illnesses. So AIDS-defining illnesses are, okay, Skin or mucous membrane includes the eyes, cytomegalovirus, retinitis, loss of vision, herpes simplex, chronic ulcers, greater than that. Remember, herpes simplex, when it comes out, the, the oral form or the genital form comes out and it lasts about two weeks, 14 days. Then it goes back down, 10 to 14 days. Herpes, uh, herpes zoster, which is the uh, shingles, that lasts about a month. It does last greater than a month. Okay, so it's likely longer than that. That's one of the diagnosed diseases, Ill, defining illnesses of AIDS. Carposia sarcoma, again, we say that was the oral black lesions, very dark lesions that appear up on the roof of the mouth. In the nervous system, cryptococcosis, extrapulmonary, okay, HIV, encephalopathy, lymphoma, primary in the brain, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, taxoplasmosis of the brain. That's part of the nervous system of the diagnosis for AIDS. The cardiovascular system, lymphatic system, okay, or different organs, coccidiodidomycosis, cytomegalovirus, okay, histoplasmosis with the distemmity or extrapulmonary, Burkett's lymphoma, immunoblastic lymphoma, um, disseminated mycobacterium canassasi, uh, disseminated mycobacterium tuberculosis, okay, and salmonella septicemia, which is recurring wasting syndrome constantly lose it, body losing a tremendous amount of weight. In the respiratory tract, you can have candidiasis. I mean, candidiasis is a yeast infection that takes over after the immune system gets compromised. <coughs> Excuse me. Herpes simplex bronchitis, mycobacterium avium complex, <coughs> tuberculosis, pneumocystic vesi and pneumonia, and pneumonia recurrent in a 12-month period. So pneumonia that occurs within 12 months after getting over it. The gastrointestinal tract, again, these are all defining illnesses for AIDS. Uh, uh, candidiasis of esophagus, and spread of yeast infection, GI tract. Herpes simplex is a chronic uh, ulcer greater than a month, okay, or esoph uh, esophagitis. Isosophoriasis, diarrhea caused by <coughs> cystiosophora, which is chronic in intestinal, greater than a month duration again. And cystosporidosis, uh, chronic intestinal disease greater than a month. Genital urinal or reproductive tract, invasive cervical carcinoma, herpes simplex and chronic, again, greater than a month duration, preventing and treating HIV infections. Okay, so those are all the diagnosis causes. Now we've got to prevent it. No vaccine is available. We can't produce a vaccine against the HIV virus. Things that we can do, to prevent the spread or event contacting HIV virus is monogamous sexual relationships. One person. If you don't, if, if one person does not have it, other person doesn't have it, and you stay monogamous in that relationship, you're not going to get it. Or there's a very small chance. There's other ways of transmitting it. Okay. The use of condoms and the use of universal precautions. Okay. Universal precautions are just like in dental offices, medical offices, you just glove and mask and sure everybody have the as you're anticipating the AIDS virus. There is no cure for the AIDS virus. Therapies can slow it down, can slow the progress of the disease or decrease the symptoms of it. Okay, we can, the different ways we treat it, again, there's no cure, but there are treatments. Inhibit viral enzymes, okay? Uh, reverse transcriptase protease integrase, okay? We can stop the different process. We can inhibit the fusion of it, inhibit the viral integration. A highly active antiviral therapies are the most effective. Okay, leukemia. So human T cell uh, lymphotrophic viruses. Leukemia is a malignant disease of the white blood cells. 
forming elements in bone marrow. Again, these all check their white blood cells. Leukemias are, are all acquired rather than be inherited. So if a patient has leukemia, it's acquired from somewhere or something. It is not inherited. Okay, you don't get it genetically. Some forms are acute, other forms are chronic. They first manifest um, easy bruising and easy bleeding. Okay, you get very pale, fatigued, recurring minor infections. Under because again, you're affecting your white blood cells in the bone marrow. Underlying pathologies, anemia, platelet deficiencies, immune dysfunction, brought about by disrupted lymphocyte ratio and function. The disrupted lymphocyte ratio is your white blood cells, your T cells, are being less and less as part of your 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 blood. That's going to that's our immune system being destroyed, not being able to handle minor infections. Okay, human T cell lymphotropic virus associated with the form of leukemia called adult T cell leukemia. Some cases first present with cutaneous T cells lymphoma, dermatitis, uh, with thickening of it, scaly, ulcerative, and tumorous skin lesions. HDLV2, close, uh, clo uh, close relative of the retrovirus, it's no distinct disease, does not cause the same problems of destruction of white blood cells. So, which of the following cells is a target of the HIV infection? Okay, so these are our HIV infections, talk about with AIDS. Remember, the HIV comes into the body. Isn't it T cells? It, it definitely destroyed, well, yes. Oh, all of the cells. Yeah, because what happens is the monocytes engulf the infection. They carry it to the dendritic cells of the nervous system. Once it goes to the dendritic cells, it goes into the nervous system and affects the T cells. Okay, And once it's in the T cells, it lies there dormant. And then it, once it's activated, it destroys the helper T cells. So it's all that they target each one of those. They target the dendritic, they call it the monocytes. Okay, they target them to, uh, towards the dendritic cells and nervous system. So it lives in the nervous system so you can't find it. So it can lay dormant, just like our, our uh, herpes virus lays dormant. Same principle. Okay, and then it affects the helper T cells by incorporating that provirus and then releasing it and killing them. So it should be all of the above, right? We agree? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so targets all of the above, the dendritic cells, the monocytes, and the helper T cells. Non-enveloped, non-segmented, single-stranded RNA viruses. The pico rhinoviruses. Pico, named pico in it as a uh, Spanish pico means small. So the pico rhinoviruses are named for their small or pico size and their RNA core. Okay, the single-stranded RNA. Important genre of these uh, pico, uh, pico rhinoviruses are the enterovirus, which is your polio virus, okay? Rhinoviruses, which is your common cold, the rhinovirus, and cardioviruses, you infect your heart and your brain. Okay, this is the list we're gonna go over here. This is kind of like the summary of it. This is your enteroviruses, what represent polio virus, the coxsackie virus A and B, ecoviruses producing, you know, hepatitis A, myocarditis, um, heart infection of the newborn, uh, poliomyelitis. Uh, the rhinoviruses are the common cold, uh, cardioviruses are encephalitis, myocardia, and foot and mouth disease for the aptoviruses. All right, the poliovirus or poliomyelitis. Poliomyelitis was a big concern back in the 1940s, 1950, before the vaccine was developed. It's acute enteroviral infections of the spinal cord that cause neuromuscular paralysis. Okay, the poliovirus is a naked capsule. It's resistant to acid, like in the stomach, and bile from the... Uh, the I'm drawing a blank on the gland that produces bile. The liver produces bile stored in the gallbladder. Okay, detergents can survive stomach acids. When it acid, a lot of us cannot survive stomach acid. So you can you can eat this virus. The stomach acids will not destroy it. Worldwide vaccination have reduced the number of cases. Eradication is expected. So pretty soon we hope to get rid of the polio virus altogether with this vaccine if we get it worldwide. Okay. But remember, the polio virus can enter the body through eating because it can survive your stomach acids and bile. It's a naked virus. It has a capsid around it, but no big coat around it, no envelope, and your RNA core, single-stranded RNA. That's what it looks like on a micro uh, light microscope. And the epidemiology of polio. It's transmitted by the fecal oral route. So from an uh, infection of the, of the feces, it's into the mouth, goes through the body. And remember, the acid stomach cannot kill it. Polioviruses, 
adhere to receptors in mucosal cells in the oral pharynx and in the intestines. They multiply in number, they shed in the throat and your feces, and some leak into the blood. Most infections are short-term and mild viremia. Okay. Some develop into mild noxious symptoms of fever, headache, nausea, sore throat, and malaysia. If viremia persists, if the virus still stays persistent in your bloodstream, okay, virus spreads to the spinal cord and brain. That's where the problem occurs. If nervous tissue is infected but not destroyed, okay, you get muscle pain, spasm, meningeal inflammation, and vague hypersensitivity. So this is the oral fecal route of the hepatitis virus. And if the, the virus maintains in the body, okay, it goes into the central nervous system and into the brain. Invasion of the motor neurons cause what's called a flaccid paralysis. Okay, decades later, post-polio symptoms, progressive muscle deterioration occurs in 25% of the patients infected with the polio virus in childhood. So you still get deformities in the legs, in the arms, uh, different types of paralysis. It's a parallel disease, paralysis of the muscles of the legs, the abdomen, the back, intercostal, diaphragm, pectoral girdle, and bladder can result. So bladder, you lose bladder control. Uh, back intercostal, the back intercostal muscles, let me get this one different color. So your back intercostal muscles, your diaphragm, do what? Those two groups, your back intercostal muscles and your diaphragm, allow you to breathe. Those are the muscles involved in respiration. Okay, so that becomes paralyzed. That's a problem. Okay, that's why you put people on ventilators, they be iron lungs back in the 1940s to allow them to force the patient to breathe, to keep them alive, some successfully, until the virus can be handled. Bulbar polyomyelitis, rare cases, requires mechanical respirators. Those are the iron lungs we talked about. Okay, you have the brain stand, the medulla, the cranial nerves are all infected. Okay, severe deformities of the trunk and limbs develop, followed by muscle atrophy, because there's no nerve cells, you don't use those muscles. Spine, shoulders, hip, knees, or feet can all be infected. This is an iron lung. Your head, pot, your head sticks out here. The rest of your body uses compressed pressure to force air into your lungs and then release it out of your lungs. Big, huge machine. You see the deformities of legs okay, with the parallel disease. Treatment and prevention of polio. Treatment is supportive for pain and suffering. Respiratory failure may require artificial ventilation. Physical therapy may be needed to prevent loss of a limb. Okay? Prevention is vaccination. Polio has a vaccine. Okay, inactivated polio vaccine is the salt vaccine. Oral polio vaccine, the, the Sabin vaccine, attenuated virus, is no longer recommended in the US. Usually we do the salt vaccine now, it's more effective. Worldwide eradication is being attempted. Okay, non polio enteroviruses. The most common is Coxsackie Kiwi viruses, A and B, and Echoviruses, and the non polio enteroviruses. They're similar to the polar virus in epidemiological and infectious characteristics, but they're less virulent. They don't cause the same virulent complexities and strain on the body as the polio, uh, poliomyelitis does. Responsible for respiratory infections, conjunctivitis, and hand foot, uh, hand, foot, mouth disease. Rare cases of Coxsackie viruses and ecoviruses, ecoviparalysis, aseptic meningitis, and symphilitis. Those are in rare cases. Type of infections, the initial phase of infection is intestinal, after which viruses enter the lymph and blood and disseminate to other organs. Important complications are the, the common cold syndrome, lower respiratory illness, pleurodynia of the, the lungs. Okay, so it affects the lungs and the uh, thoracic cavity. Rare P viruses and ecosis, aseptic meningitis and symphilitis. Okay, eruptive skin rashes, hand, foot, mouth disease, and acute hemorrhagic conjunctivitis. You can see the conjunctivitis in that picture there. And hepatitis A virus and infectious hepatitis. Cubicle picoronaviruses, uh, pico relatively resistant to heat and acid, not carried chronically. Principal reservoirs are asymptomatic, short-term carriers, or people with clinical disease. Okay, so fecal or transmission, same as the polio virus, multiplies in small intestine and enters the blood and is carried to the liver. Most infections are subclinical or they're very vague. The flu-like symptoms can occur and jaundice is seldom present. It does not affect the liver that much. 
hepatitis A and infectious hepatitis, there's no specific treatment once the symptoms begin. Okay. We do have a vaccination for hepatitis A. Okay, but we do we have hepatitis for hepatitis A, hepatitis B, but no vaccination for hepatitis C. So vaccination is inactivated and attenuated viral vaccines. It's pooled immune serial, uh, serum uh, globulin for those entering into the endemic area. So you get those vaccines if you go into an endemic area that has hepatitis A. Okay, poliomyelitis is genetically acquired via what? How do you get poliomyelitis? Oh, no, I, I said it wrong, I'm sorry. Poliomyelitis is generally, not genetically. Inject poliomyelitis is general. <laughs> I'm giving you... Ingestion. Hey, it's, 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 it's two o'clock in the morning here, so <laughs> where I'm at. I get a little... Poliomyelitis is generally acquired via either sexual contact, insect vector, ingestion, or inhalation. Which one would it be for poliomyelitis? Remember, how's it transmitted? Fecal oral route. And it's, it's one of the few viruses that are resistant to stomach acids and bile. So it's acquired, where is our picture? We'll bring it back. Let's go to polio. Okay. There's a picture I'm looking for. Oops, I must have passed it. The blood transmit there. Rip, there we go. Polio is transmitted by the fecal oral route. Okay, receptors in the sun, multiply in the intestine. Uh, it goes into the intestine, and so it comes into feces, get infected that, and comes into the mouth. You ingest it, it goes in the stomach, and gets absorbed. So if we look at the epidemiology of it, let's go back to our question and say, so it's generally acquired how? Poliomyelitis. Ingestion. Ingestion, that's the fecal oral route. It's shared with ingestion. It's not inhalation, it doesn't come from insects or sexual contact, it comes from ingestion of it, okay? Polymyelitis is generally acquired via ingestion, perfect. All right, the human rhinoviruses. Rhinoviruses are common cold. There's more than 110 serotypes of it, and that's what causes our common cold. That's why when you have a common cold, you don't use antibiotics because there's no Bacterial infection, it's a virus. Okay, unique molecular services make development of vaccine unlikely. Okay, many strains circling in the population at one time acquired from contaminated hands and fomites. Remember, that's why you wash your hands, and fomites are contaminated surfaces, forks, spoons, countertops, napkins, things that the virus has landed on. Those are your fomites. That's how you transmit it. The rhinovirus, um, those are the antibodies that are made to it. You have what's called a knob antigen and a pocket antigen. You can see how the shape of these things. These are in a little pocket, and these are on top of the hill. So they're knobs. Okay. So you have a knob antigen and a pocket antigen. And the antibody is exposed to these knob antigens on the top when it binds to it. So the sensitivity to acidic environments, often temperature is about 33 degrees centigrade. Higher than that, they're sensitive to heat. Okay. Symptoms of the rhinovirus, we all know headache, chills, fever, sore throat, cough, nasal drainage. Treatment is treat the symptoms. That's what you do. Lots of fluids, lots of rest, treat the sense of hand washing and care and handling nasal secretions. Okay. Non enveloped, non segmented, single stranded RNA viruses. Okay. The Calistic virus. It's Norwalk Asians is best known, believed to cause one third of all viral gastroenteritis cases, transmitted again by the fecal or route, just like poliomyelitis, infections at all ages, any time of the year. Acute onset, nausea, vomiting, cramps, diarrhea, chills. Rapid and complete recovery. Doesn't last long. The real viruses, usually double-stranded RNA genome. That's unusual. Most RNA genomes are single-stranded, like the, like the HIV virus and the, the rhinovirus. The real virus and the rotavirus are two types. The real virus is a cold-like upper, upper respiratory infection, enteritis, and the rotavirus. This is the oral fecal transmission, primary viral causes of mortality and morbidity resulting from diarrhea in infants and children. Diarrhea is a major cause of death in a lot of the undeveloped countries. They have to supplement those because dehydration will cause mortality. This is what the real virus looks like, light microscope. 
and prions. Prions on spongy form and cephalopathies. Prions are very, very interesting compounds. Okay, very specific way of causing diseases. Um, prions, these are one of the things that they are linking um, actual Alzheimer's research to. It's the development of these in the brain, not as specifically these, but they're starting to see some of these developments and they're very interesting. And the new research is going in that direction. So the proteinaceous infectious particles, Okay, so they're proteins and they're infectious particles. They're highly resistant to chemicals, radiation, and heat. Okay, cause transmissible spongy form encephalopathies in humans, which is lesions in your brain. Okay. I got a chat message that just popped up. I just, I just saw it. Let me see if I can pull that up. Oh, it just said C. Okay. Oh, that was from earlier, Professor. Sorry. Oh, when okay. you're <laughs> I just saw pop up. No problem. Because <laughs> it's kind of weird working like this. It's a, it's a different way of working here, but everything's working pretty good so far, which is good. Okay, so the causes of these prions, okay, the transmissible spongy form and cephalopathies in humans, it's Kreutz Jacobs Felt disease. That's what we call it. Kreutz Jacobs, Kreutz Jacobs disease, CG day. And in animals, it's called mad cow disease. That's why Macaulay is so is prevalent in animals. That's why we have to track it so quickly, because the way to get it, you'll see, that, is by eating meat that's infected with prions. Okay, properties of the agents of spongy form encephalopathies consistent entirely of proteins with no nucleic acid. Okay, think about that. They're proteins. There's no nucleic acid. There's no RNA. There's no DNA. There's no way of getting other things to reproduce it. They're doing it on their own. Okay, they're very unique. They're very resistant to chemicals, radiation, heat, which he said. They can withstand autoclaving. So if you have prions and you like them, they can still be around. They are not this tender little thing. They do not present virus morphology in electron microscopes to affect the brain tissue. You don't see them. They don't look like a virus. They're not integrated into the nucleic acid infected host cells because they don't have any nucleic acids. They do not elicit inflammatory reaction or cytopathic effects in the host. Okay. They do not elicit antibody formation, so you don't make antibodies against them. They're responsible for vacuoles, which are holes or spacing or odd number of fibers forming in the brain of the host. So it's, it's forms these vacuoles inside the brain, transmitted only by close, direct contact with infected tissues and secretions. You get it by eating meat or eating brain tissue that has prions in it. Whether you eat cow brains with mad cow disease, or you eat human brains with cannibalism, with uh, Jacob's Clint, uh, Clo uh, I forgot the name, I can't keep pronouncing the name right. Crutzfield Jacob's disease, okay? So you get, I guess with no antibody formation, they form these vacuoles or holes in the brain, and you get direct contact with infected tissue. And it, it, the tissue is brain tissue. So Kreutzfeldt Jacob disease is an alteration in the structure of a normal uh, PRP protein found in the brain. So these abnormal PRP proteins result in nerve cell death, spongy form damage, and severe loss of brain function. Transmission is through direct or indirect contact with infected brain tissue or the cerebral spinal fluid of an infected cow or infected person. Okay, so this is what it looks like. This is your normal brain here on this side over here. These are your neurons coming through and these are glial cells. Remember if you're anatomy, glial cells help support the neurons. Okay, help nourish them, keep them supported, All right? Now look at the difference. Look at this, look at this, look at this. Huge holes in the brain, okay? Those are the spongy form lesions, those are the vacuoles that are formed. That disrupts the brain tremendously, okay? Completely destroys brain function. Okay, so variant cruise of Jacob's disease became apparent in the late 1990s after eating meat from cattle afflicted with the bovine spongy form encephalitis, which is mad cow disease. That's where you ever see these articles that, that mad cow disease was found in something. It goes back and traces it to the farm and they wipe out and kill all the bacteria, all the, calf, the cows from that farm. Okay, that's why it's so important to track where our beef is coming from. Okay, difficult to diagnose, requires examination of biopsy brain. Okay, or nervous tissues. 
you have to biopsy the brain. Most of the time you biopsy of a brain that's usually a person in extreme condition for that. Prevention relies on avoidance of any contact with contaminated tissue. That's how you prevent it. There's no vaccine, something like that you just don't eat human brains and don't eat beef and fed from that cow disease. That's it's prevention. No treatment is available for it. Once you've got it, you've got it. Okay, you will die. It will destroy your brain. There is no if Andrew butts about it. There's no treatment available. Medical intervention focuses on easing your symptoms, making the person comfortable until they die. Okay, so it's a tremendously severe disease. Okay, it's a, they're very strange proteins. There are no nucleic acids in them. So which of the following enzymes would degrade the causative agents for Creutzfeldt disease? Okay, so if a patient has Creutzfeldt disease, you're gonna treat them. How are you gonna treat them to treat the causes of the disease? Nucleases, are you gonna give them nucleases? Nucleases break down nucleic acids, will that help? No, because I think it's D. Okay, well, why won't nucleic acids help? Because there's no nucleic acids, right? Right. You're, Absolutely right. Proteases. Proteases break down proteins, but these are abnormal proteins that are formed, the PRP proteins, so it won't degrade them. And then the other one says both nucleases and proteases. No, and you're right. Neither one's going to affect it. It's an incurable disease, has no treatment, and there's no nucleic acids in it. There's no normal proteins in it, and it's causing these big holes in the brain. So you're right. None of the above for Crystal Jacobs syndrome. 